Jimmy Engineer, our guest today, comes from Pakistan. Uh, today, sometimes the image of Pakistan may conjure up in our minds uh, uh, a, a picture of challenges, challenges. But these challenges have their positive sides as well. Uh, it's the struggle of a people. And very often, a nation has to have challenges in order to rise like the kite against the wind. Pakistan is a cradle, as everyone knows, of ancient civilization. Indus Valley, Gangara, to mention two of them. And such a heritage, rich heritage, has enabled uh, it, and many of its citizens, our speaker included, to make contribution to the finer arts as well, music, songs, poetry, paintings. Uh, just as we know from the European Renaissance, or even before prior to that, uh, the arts have a way of stabilizing society. And I have no doubt that Pakistan's rich cultural and artistic heritage will help shape the destiny of that nation. Uh, artists like uh, uh, Jimmy Engineer not only copy, uh, copy uh, beauty, but actually create it. Uh, small wonder he is called a, 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 a social uh, activist, a social crusader. But I shall let him speak on his life and his views on art. But might I add that after the Q&A, uh, he'll speak for about 30 minutes or so, and then we'll have a question and answer session for 25 minutes. Uh, we'll have a small ceremony whereby he will introduce his biography. So with these few words, Mr. Engineer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Dr. Dr. Khan Ahmed Chaudhary, our ambassador, Fayyad Rasan Javed, Tomiko, who actually inaugurated our exhibition when I was here in Singapore, and enlightened ladies and gentlemen. Actually, every time I speak, it's very difficult where to start because I don't only live a life of an artist. As an artist, I'm an idealistic person. As a social worker, I'm attached and detached from the people that I help. As a human rights activist, I have to be aggressive because I'm fighting for rights that people are deprived of. And as a peace activist, I have to be very peaceful because there you cannot be aggressive because people say that you are a peace activist, why are you aggressive? So there are four different kind of lives I live. But I'll start with my childhood. I was born in a Zoroastrian family in a very remote area of Pakistan, in Balochistan. And in Balochistan, this place, Loyalai, there was no electricity there at the time when I was born. I was very young, and my father was an engineer, and he was constructing roads and bridges there. Later on, we moved to the city of Lahore in Punjab, where I started schooling. And I started work on large pieces of paper with powder color at the age of four and five. And my parents used to encourage me to paint. And I used to sit on those paper and create designs, abstract. And from there, I, my imagination grew. When I was six years old and I was in the school, 
I had to leave school because I felt very ill. And all the doctors told my parents that I will not live more than three months. My parents were very worried and because I was the eldest son. So they diagnosed that both my kidneys had failed, both. They were non-functional and I had the worst form of nephritis. And every doctor that my parents took me to, they said the same thing, that he will not live for more than three months. But when three months passed, my health improved. And all the doctors and everybody were quite amazed at what happened. I was supposed to die, but I did not die. So the doctor said, hey, please bring your son. We want to check him. So they called me, and all the doctors checked whether I had a kidney transplant or I had a, uh, some kind of an operation done or something. There was no mark on my body. There was nothing. And they were very amazed. They said, how is it possible? So then they checked my kidneys. And they told my parents that these are not the same kidneys that we had checked. So actually, nature gave me two brand new kidneys in my body at the age of six. That is why so many things that I do is that I'm repaying him for giving me a second chance. That is why, as an artist, I am working for causes, hundreds of causes. I am working with the special children, with the orphans, with widows, with prisoners in jails, with patient, poor patients in hospitals. I go and visit them. I don't even know who the patient is, but I go and visit them and I help them. And when I was growing up, People used to ask me, what is your philosophy? And I used to say, giving. And they said, what do you mean by giving? So I used to tell them that if you put your hand in your pocket and whatever you have in it and give it away and don't think about it, that is what giving <coughs> means. So as I grew up, I used to give away my things to other children other people. As I grew up, I gave away the money that I earned from my art to people who needed money. And in 40 years of my professional life, 70% of whatever I earned, I gave away to people. So, as an artist, <coughs> I became serious after the age of 16 and 17 because I was studying in a college which was not nothing to do with fine arts. And the professors used to come and tell me that you are supposed to study stats and maths. And all day, you are drawing in the class. You're drawing in the grounds. You're drawing in the cafeteria. So why don't you join an arts institute? So I said, OK, that's a good idea. I went and told my parents that the professors are saying, instead of doing these subjects, I am only drawing. So my parents said, OK, we'll put you in an art college. So I, I took admission in an art college. But then they said that it's very difficult to live on only painting. So why don't you join the design section? So I joined the design section in the art college. But I was in the design section, and all the time I used to paint in the fine art studio. So after six months, the professor said, okay, why don't you join the fine art? Because all the time you're interested in painting. So I joined the fine art. And then I was sleeping there, working there for days, 
and I was not doing my class work. All the professors were amazed that they would give me a class assignment and I would be painting something that I only wanted to do. So they said, you are not bothered about marks or anything. I said, no. I said, I came here to use the facilities, the studio, the lights, which I don't have. So when I was in my final year in the arts college, there was a debate that do artists require degrees or not. So I told everybody, okay, why are you discussing? I will walk out of the gate in my final year and see if an artist requires a degree or not. So I just walked out of the college in my final year and I went home and I told my parents I have left the college. They said, why? I said, everybody were discussing and I wanted to save that time. So I said, I will walk out. So I walked out without a degree in 76. 75, I I started painting, but always uppermost in my mind was to promote my country, Pakistan. I painted the history, the partition of India, the sacrifices of people, because I wanted the younger generation to know how many lives were lost for the creation of a country. And all those people who sacrificed never saw the country. But they just gave the life. So I painted the whole series. But I was not born in 47. I was born much later, 54. And in 74, I used to get dreams about the partition. I had to see blood dripping. I had to see burning trains, bridges, all these things. And I used to be disturbed in my sleep. And my parents say that I used to talk to someone sitting down in my sleep. I was talking to somebody about partition. So I talked to a Sufi, a very famous Sufi. And I was his disciple for many years. His name was Sufi Barkatali of Faisalabad. And he was a very spiritual man. And he told me that I have to paint these paintings to take it out of my system. So I used to paint all my dreams of partition. But not because I wanted people to think negatively about it. I wanted people to think positive. I wanted the younger generation to know and give importance to the country for the struggle that took place. So I kept on working on this partition series. And then in 1981, I stopped because the thing that used to bother me left me and didn't get any dream. And I was painting a painting, The Burning Train, and it just left me. So I left the painting incomplete, and I started painting landscapes, and still life, seascape. Then in 81, our greatest national poet, Ilama Iqbal, he's a world famous poet, and a lot of his uh, uh, research work is done in Germany. So his son called me and said that, why don't you paint one of the most challenging poetic work called Javed Dama. It's a travel into universe. So I said, OK, I will try. So I had a discussion with him. And then I read some letter written by the poet. He wanted some artist to paint this work in his lifetime. But nobody painted in his lifetime. And in 81, I started working on that poetic work. And then in some of his letters he wrote, he said that the person who will paint this philosophy 
His name will circulate all over the world. But he said only an artist will not be able to paint. paint. He goes on and saying, in Urdu I will say a word, it's called ilam e ilahi It means psychic powers. A person who will have psychic power will be able to paint this. Otherwise, he would not be able. In 82, I completed this work. And then books were printed, documentaries were made by BBC and other channels and other countries came to see this work and things like that. I fulfilled his dreams, but much after his death. And it enlightened me also, because I will give you some instances in the painting. There was a scene where Jamaluddin Afghani is pointing towards the earth and saying that Russia will break up. I'm talking in 1982. And Russia was in one, it was one country at that time. And some Russian gentleman who came and he saw the painting, he asked me, what is this? I said, this is breaking of Russia. So he was smiling. He said, how can that happen? I said, our poet predicted it in 1930s. So, after years, he rang me and he said, you were right, Russia has been broken. Then there are scenes in that where the old gods are rejoicing that there is disunity among the Muslim community. They should be united. This also in 1930 predicted. And there are many other predictions which he made which I painted in this painting. So after that, I used to do landscape, still life, seascape, architectural composition, and historical and philosophical and all sorts of painting as that. And people usually ask me, why do I paint so many things? Why don't I paint one theme or one style? So I tell them, that I am a student of nature. I am a student of the master who is perfect. And I will always remain a student because I will keep learning. So I am still a student and I am still learning. That is why I paint so many things. I have always tried to achieve level of excellence, <coughs> but I will always remain a student. Because one of the names of Allah is called Al Musawa. It means the greatest artist of them all, the greatest fashioner of them all, the greatest designer of them all. So I am his pupil. So all my life I have been in search of my master. That is why when my publishers were printing the book and Marjorie Hussain was writing the book, they asked me, what should be the name of your book? So I said, it should be in search of my master. Because I have always been searching him in my walks and going to people who are suffering. I have been searching him. So I did a lot of exhibitions. And in 1989, my work was collected at the Modern Museum New York. There were 72 artists from 68 countries that participated. And this is the most prestigious award, the National Endowment of the Arts Award. So I was the only Pakistani ever to receive it in 1989. And then I traveled to USA, I gave lectures to people. And I used to always tell them that our country has great poets great writer, great artist, but the perception in the international media is very negative because they don't cover our cultural side. So, and I'll tell you that Pakistan has two people. I've traveled to so many countries all over the world. I've never found 
any person from that country who has produced two such people in our country, they are living people. One is Abdul Sattar Eidi, he's a very famous social worker. He has the largest ambulance service in the world. And his book is, his name is also in the book of Guinness. And he has 1,500 ambulances service, and he has helicopters and everything. And he was from the street. From the street, he grew to this level. And he goes to different countries. When the tsunami came in Sri Lanka, he went there. He goes to Japan. He goes all over the world. And the other gentleman is Dr. Adibul Hassan Rizvi. He's a urologist. Now, this man gives free dialysis to 400 people every day, free. And he does more than thousands of operations free. And when you enter his hospital, the beds are free, the medicines are free, treatment is free. I have been to all countries and I have tried to find out if there is one hospital which gives so many directors free, so many patients. So we are proud of certain people that we have in our country, though our perception might be negative, but we have got outstanding people. Now, walks. I have done hundreds of walks for causes, for cancer, for leprosy, for blind children, for uh, law and order. But two walks are very famous. One was in 1994. I walked through every village in my country, in every town, on foot in 94. I walked for one year. And I walked about 4,700 kilometers. And I met millions of people from villages. And I wanted to see the suffering of people. That is why I was born in a Zoroastrian family, but I accepted all the religions as my personal religion. If somebody tells me you are a Hindu, I say thank you very much. And if somebody says, you are a Muslim, I still thank him. Because I wanted to see that all people from different religions are suffering, and they have pain and agony. And I've seen that certain people would only help certain types of people. So I went on this long walk, and I saw how people suffer. I walked in the sun, 40 kilometers in the sun, I would walk day in and day out. And I went through jungle, through desert, I slept on the roads, just like these people. I wanted to see how they suffer. I slept in villages, in towns, wherever I got a place, I just slept. For one year, I kept on walking. And the other walk, which was famous, was in 2001. In 2001, I had dreams in March that the relationship between India and Pakistan will not be good. So I gave a press conference in March, and I said that I will do this walk in November. They said, why November? I said then the things will be bad at that time when I do the walk. And I was going to walk from Islamabad to Delhi. And I gave the date of 30th November. And, and I had both the flags on my chest, India and Pakistan. No Pakistani or Indian ever had these two flags together. But I carried them on my chest. And there was peace embossed underneath that flag. And I had a green collar with a crescent and a star. And people said, how will you walk with the Indian flag in Pakistan? What will people say? I said, I am walking for the sake of peace. So I will carry both the flags on my chest. So I started the walk. Now what happened? In between came September 11th, 
when things happened in USA. So people said, you were talking about India, but things are happening in Afghanistan. Why don't you walk towards Afghanistan? I said, no. I said, wait and see. Then October came. Then some statement came from India. The statement came from Pakistan. And we were actually all at loggerhead, both the countries. And then my time came to, for walking. So I started my walk. Even in that difficult circumstances, I walked with the same flag and I walked from Islamabad to the Indian border. And things became so bad that all the diplomatic ties finished between India and Pakistan. There was no diplomatic ties, nothing. I reached the border. But all the rangers and everybody were very happy. They said, you woke us up because you were walking with the two flags, and every time the media would cover the two flags, and people would think that, how can I carry two flags when situation is so bad? And I came to the border. And then I was supposed to walk to Delhi, but all the diplomatic ties finished. I could not cross. But the gates were open. They said, you can cross. There was an international media there. They said, you cross. I said, let me think whether I should cross or I should not cross. So I meditated on the line between India and Pakistan. And after a while, I said, I will not cross. He said, why? I said, I was supposed to wake up the people, but I don't want to break any rules and regulations. Because today, the international media told me that we'll give you headlines. I said, I don't need headlines. I walked here because my inner soul told me that things weren't good and you do this walk. I did this walk. And then I gave a statement to all the international media there. I said that peace between India and Pakistan will not come only with cricket matches and singers going and actresses coming here and everything. I said, no. I said peace between India and Pakistan will only come when the 1% people from both sides will agree. It is not the problem of the 99% people. They have no issue. People to people, there is no problem. They come and go. But I said, unless that issue is not solved, peace will never come between India and Pakistan. I said that to all the international media there, which was there, the Voice of America, the BBC, the German radio, and all these others, they were all there. And I said that. And today also I am saying this, that peace will come when those 1% will agree and our 1% will agree. So, but I did this walk because I saw it in my dreams and I gave the date in March. I never knew 9-11 will happen and what will happen, but I knew that it will come. So these were the two famous walks out of all my other walks for leprosy and for, I've walked with the leprosy patients, I've led ambulances, I've walked in front of trucks, and I've walked for uh, so many causes, you know. And then my major interest was to help the special children. Before 2001, parents used to be very embarrassed. They used to hide their special children in the houses, he wouldn't take them out in public and other places. So I said I must change their life. So I started a program, Fun and Food, for special children. In my first program, I took 200 blind children to a restaurant. It was called Village Restaurant. And the bearers and everybody were fascinated. 200 blind children in a restaurant. they never seen something like this. And after I took those children there, the bearers told me, the waiters told me, everybody told me that our lives have changed. Because we were serving them. We have never served these special children like that. So I was very encouraged. I said, that's good. So then I did another program in some hotel, another public place. Then I took 600 children, 500 children. So till date, 
I have done more than 140 programs for special children. And now parents call me and say, take our children to your program. They are not embarrassed because so much media, so much awareness has taken place. When I work with the prisoners in the jail, I do sport activity jail. And even in all my programs, there has never been a chief gap. If I am doing a, my program in the jail, the prisoners are the chief guys. If I am doing special children, they are the chief guys. Even when I did a program for special children at the governor house in Punjab, I told the governor, you will not be the chief guest, you will just be the host. Children will be the chief guest. I wanted to give importance to special children. We call special children, but we don't give them any special love, special privileges. We don't even give them anything special, but we just call them special, you know. I wanted to change the life, and till to date, before coming also, I had a program a week ago, I took 100 children to Karachi Gymkhana. A club never allowed these children, but I made them love these children, and I've done so many programs at Karachi Gymkhana also, and at other hotels. They never saw so many things. When I did this program in Sri Lanka, and those people were amazed, you know, because when I went to Sri Lanka and I said I want to change the lives of special children, they said, what can you do? I said, I will tell you. I booked their five stars, five hotels, and I took their orphans, their, and I said, if the rich kids can go there, these special children also can go there. So I did five, six programs in Sri Lanka, and now some of them follow my program. And even in India, they follow some of my program in hotels, they take in pension children and all these other things. So then I work with widows, I work with women in jails. And uh, when I went to one of the jails, we never had judicial complex. So they, the Ministry of Human Rights told me that we need a judicial complex in the jail. So I raised money for the first judicial complex in Pakistan, in the central jail of Karachi. I went to a foundation and I told them in the night that tomorrow morning I need the money to start the work. So the whole night they were thinking and in the morning that foundation gave the money to build the first judicial complex in Pakistan. Then I was involved in anti baggery campaigns also. And then I was with, uh, working with the drug addicts. So when I look back and I see that since I work with nature, so I have to help everyone. And I love coming to Singapore. I come here and I see people of all religion living peacefully, practicing their religion peacefully. And I'm so happy that Singapore celebrates all the religious festivity of all the religions. That is what is required for peaceful coexistence. So I really love coming to Singapore. Sometimes I feel that I should work in all the countries of the world. But it's not possible. I had the privilege of meeting Mother Teresa. I had a long talk with her. I gave her my friends and I met her. I was very enlightened, you know, to meet somebody like her. But I want to tell you what is my designation in my country. I call myself the servant of Pakistan. My designation is of a servant because they are supposed to serve only. So I call myself the servant of Pakistan. But I try to visit many countries of the world. I talk to people. I show them my work. And I say to them that Pakistan in philanthropy is one of the leading countries. They do so much philanthropy in our country. 
there are people there who give food to every person who requires food every day. There's a Salani truck which gives food to everyone. They first ask them to wash their feet, their hands, and they make them sit down, and then they give food to them. And there is a poor lady, poor lady who also gives food to poor families for only three rupees, a whole meal and everything, because she gets the donation. Her name is Parveen. And I met her twice. And we were both on the talk shows also, and a couple of morning shows and everything. And I was so happy to meet her. So in philanthropy, our country is one of the leading countries. But unfortunately, there's war on terrorism and all these things are the headlines. But we are positive people, we have positive thinking. And I, as a Pakistani, am willing to help any person in any country of the world. I can give my services in any country. I can do walks in any country, any cause. I have always told people from different countries that I am willing to work in any country. So I think Pakistanis are positive people. Even now, when tourists and people from abroad go there, people <coughs> give their homes, people give them food, people look after them. So I think we should start thinking in a positive manner about our country, Pakistan. And I'm happy that I was given a chance to talk at this platform. And I can only share ideas because I'm not a scholar or a professor in any given subject, actually. Not a learned person. But I can only share my life with people and what actually I've done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. It was uh, truly moving, the story of your life. Uh, you say that uh, you're not a learned person in books, etc., but your life is a book, it's a book in itself. And uh, there, all of us here today have learned a lot from you, not just in terms of emotions or in terms of sacrifice for the welfare of human, uh, human beings. But, uh, but certain elements of humanity itself, irrespective of religion, country, etc., the kind of uh, struggle that you have uh, let yourself do. Uh, in your introduction, I hadn't read it then, uh, uh, I noticed that you have also been recognized by, by the state uh, as a Sitari in Tiaz, which, by the way, is one of the highest awards that Pakistan gives for, for contribution uh, to the arts. Uh, the floor is now open for question and answer. I should uh, request you to identify yourself when you pose the question and speak a bit loudly because... I'm quite deaf, actually. Uh, I've myself become a special person over the years. You're a special person in many ways, but that is one of them. So, speak loudly. Yes, Mrs. Suryanara. Surya from ISAS. I was just wondering who that 1% in India and 1% in Pakistan are. <laughs> And, and how I will tell you. And how you want to change them? <laughs> I, I, am, I will not be able to change them. Because I was at the border carrying the flag. And let me ask, tell you something. I asked the Indian media at that time, that is there one person in India who will carry the Pakistani flag and walk in India? They said no. So at least I was privileged to carry Indian flag and showed my part of it, that I'm carrying your flag. So that part I played. Let me tell you who these people are. They have no names, they have no color, and they have no form, but they are the people who will not let peace come. You can call them extremists in any, many ways. Their thinking is extremist. They might not be extremists in their way, of action, but the thinking is extremist. They don't want people to come together. They are the 1%. Because 99%, if you ask the public,
they have no problem with Pakistani because the Indians who come to Pakistan, they are so happy when they see the progress, when they see all the, when they look at the houses and look at the development Pakistan has made, they're quite happy, you know. They think that we have come a long way because uh, even people from USA, when they visit Pakistan, they look at only the houses of the people there and they think that I think Pakistan is doing well. So it's not the problem. It's those people whose mindset does not allow them that both the countries should come together. Yeah. Professor Jeffrey and then you, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Engineer, uh, I'm, my name's Robin Jeffrey. I work in ISIS. What's the, uh, what is your mission to Singapore on this occasion? You say you'd like to come to Singapore, but what's your particular mission on this visit? It's not only Singapore. Hmm. I go to Europe, I go to London, US, here I travel extension. In Singapore, when I came, it's a very small country. And if people would follow its example, and how much reserve it has, and it doesn't have industries also. It doesn't even produce anything here, but still people are so happy here. The law and order, the strict rules and everything, everybody abides by the rules here. What I like to do here is to give my art to different places. I've already donated my art to different places. And I would like to come and interact with people and have more Pakistanis come to Singapore and more Singaporeans go to Pakistan and then connect that. So my mission is not to make great changes. I can only express myself and then I come here to make friends like uh, Mr. Tomiko, who was kind enough to come to our exhibition last time. And whenever I come, I try to meet him. So I am in touch with all the people that I met last time. And I've made great friends here. So I come here to enhance the friendship between Pakistan and India. That is all. Okay. <laughs> Narendra Gavar from TPA, the German Press Agency. Mm -hmm. I had a chance to... Uh, Narendra Gavar from DPA, the German Press Agency. I had a chance to go through your book, and I was flipping the pages. Uh, I was wondering how you could paint the pictures of the partition, which you sort of explained today that you were born in 54, but you had dreams, and sort of very vivid dreams. Uh, uh, what I'm uh, trying to, can you explain what creates the dream or how do these dreams uh, take place? Dream change. Okay, I'll tell you. When I was very young, I used to still walk away from my home and go into the field and sit down alone. And many times my life was shown to me, many times that I'll be doing walks. I was not walking for walks for causes or anything when I was young. Mm -hmm. But I was shown that I am going among the blinds, among the people who are suffering. So I used to go and tell my parents that every time I go there, I see these visions there, that I'll be walking all the time, and I'll be doing. So the same way the partition dreams used to come, I used to see, like my eyes are open but I can see anything I want to see in front of me. So I used to see all these things happening, but I never saw these things. I never read about it. So I used to see amazing things, people being killed and burning and people massacred and all the caravans coming and things. So I used to see them, even with my eyes open, and I could see them with my eyes closed. So I was very disturbed at that time because I didn't understand it. So I asked the Sufi. He told me that this belongs to the scenes of partition. And he told me that I have to take it out of my system and to paint them. So 
from 75 onward, I was painting these series till 81. And then these dreams disappeared, and I left painting these paintings. So otherwise, there is no other uh, possibility, because I <coughs> never read about it. I never saw pictures about it. So how would I know what it is? So that is why. Well, Mr. Engineer, you spoke of social harmony, for instance. I mean, and then you mentioned people in Pakistan, like Mr. Edi. I had the privilege to uh, interact with him as well. And you mentioned uh, Dr. Rizvi. Uh, is there something you are thinking of, uh, you and like-minded people, of doing something for the sake of harmony in Pakistan itself? You see, uh, I'll tell you something. You can be as harmonious. You can be as harmonious. You can be as good. But in Pakistan, some of the terrorism takes place. It's not done by Pakistanis. It is done by people. There was so much war in Uzbek and all these people who are fighting war. Now the war has ended there. So they have entered Afghanistan. From Afghanistan, they entered our country. And in that, in our country, they are war machines. They are people, they don't know anything else. Like the people in Somalia, they are pirates. They are kidnapping Pakistanis, Indians, they are kidnapping Bangladeshi, they are kidnapping foreigners, and they are taking ransom. And the whole world cannot do anything about it. Just now also the Pakistanis were released after they paid $2.5 million for them. So if they can operate in Somalia and they can uh, kidnap Americans and Britishers and all these people. So these people enter our country and then they don't know anything else. They only know how to fight, how to kill. So when they start doing things, you can do whatever you like. Like I am giving a positive lecture here. Tomorrow there is a blast somewhere. And in the paper it comes, blast in Pakistan. So whatever I have talked, is overshadowed by the dark. So I mean, we can try, we can only try, but we can't force people to become harmonious. That's why I say, if people are spiritually enlightened, spiritually enlightened, then I think there is more chances of harmony and peace. Because the spiritual person will embrace anyone. It is not necessary that a very religious person will embrace everyone, but a spiritual enlightened man will embrace everyone. So I think we should try and follow the life of Sufis and spiritual life. I think that is the only way to bring harmony in the world. I think you have to speak loud oh, enough. <laughs> You're a very great painter and also a very great person. You've done so much for humanity. Apart from contributing your um, earnings to uh, society, have you ever thought of combining the two? Sort of like holding workshops for, say, special children that want to express their creativity? Or um, have you ever done anything like that? And you want to do that too? Well, uh, have you uh, combined uh, your philanthropy activities, uh, combined the two? for special children. Uh, are you thinking of, uh, do you have a plan for uh, something? Yes, yes. I, I've had a lot of uh, art competition for special children. I've arranged, I've arranged uh, cricket matches for blind cricketers. And uh, when I uh, invite these special children to my function, they are giving a stage and they perform, they sing, they do whatever they want. They are the heroes of that day, you know. So I always tell them, you are my prime minister, you are my president today, so you do whatever you feel like. So I do interact with them in every way. I do arrange things for them. Well, uh, if the, yes. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Engineer, okay, my name is Tang Lee. I am a blogger. I also write commentary pieces for some of the Middle Eastern publications. Just as a, a side, do you see it, think it's possible for the artists of Pakistan to form 
perhaps a hypothetical movement that will raise the image and, like you said, the good things about Pakistan, uh, the philanthropy, the generosity of the people, beyond the headlines of terrorism and violence? You see, this word social work is something which comes from within. You can't motivate people. Yes, you can tell people, but you can't make them do it. So, from my childhood, I wanted to help people. And I'm sure if there would have been so many other artists who wanted to do social work, then there would have been hundreds of artists. But there are not very many artists who do social work. There are artists who paint beautifully, and they have achieved great uh, <coughs> level in the world. Many artists. M.F. Hussain of India was my very close friend also. We used to usually meet in Dubai or London. But uh, they used to not do philanthropy. I used to ask him sometimes, why don't you do philanthropy? He said, why do philanthropy? I would rather uh, spend money in other ways. You can't motivate people like that. You ha it comes from within. Just serving people, helping people, it comes from within. You can't train people, you can't tune people to do this. You know, it has to come from within. And I, I wish that uh, many artists in our country or other countries, because art is universal. It doesn't have boundaries. Pakistani artists, Indian artists, Singaporean artists, we belong to the same family. <coughs> all of the artists, whether they are Chinese, they are Chinese artists, we're all in the same family. So they should, I think more people should come forward and uh, create a better image in it. But it's a very personal thing. You can't force people to do that. Yes, Professor Moni. Uh, in answer to a question, you just now said that the terrorism is being done only by outsiders in Pakistan. Uh, are you sure that there is no Pakistani no, involved? Ajay, in let me give you an example. Many times, terrorism happens in India or Pakistan. Anywhere. No, by anywhere. The local people are involved. But they are involved who require money. Again, it's economics. A person sometimes does negative things because of money, not because he wants to do it. Because he has to look out his family and things, and he's offered money. So many times all over the world, negative things are done because of economic problems. It's not that they are born terrorists. I don't think any person is born a bad person. I have met prisoners all my life in jails. They are not born bad people. The society sometimes make them bad, and sometimes different circumstances make them bad. So they are not all outside people, but, but Terrorism takes place all over the world, even in USA. There are American, American nationals who are involved in terrorism in America. There are British nationals in Britain. So in different countries, different nationals are involved. But there are people from abroad which also come and disturb the peaceful atmosphere of the country. So it's not always outsider, could be insider, but they are people who have some problem. Otherwise, they have some negative attitude. They have some thing to prove. There are many possibilities. Because when these people are caught and when they talk, they give a lot of instances why they do these things. Because their families have been killed in certain ways, they want to take revenge. There are many ways why people do these things. Because there are people who murder, people who rape. There's something wrong with them. That's why they do such a thing. So I think uh, every country has negativity and positivity. But because so many international countries are also involved in our, in our country, that is why the international exposure is so greater than any other country. So that's why the negativity comes down in a bigger proportion when our country comes in question.
Uh, uh, just one second, Professor Tommy Cole, and then Madam. I'll defer to her. She, uh, he, he will see the ball. I would like to add what Jimmy uh, Junior is saying because I myself am from Karachi and Pakistan, and I'm very proud that Mr. Jimmy Junior is here and he's sharing his views and how he thinks it's important to, you know, highlight the positive uh, aspect of Pakistan. Coming to some of the questions that how these, you know, little, um, what you say, instances or these efforts uh, can actually, you know, go beyond the uh, negative image of Pakistan. So actually, it's just a beginning and uh, I myself working in the United Nations Association of Singapore is uh, doing a lot and uh, me being a Pakistani here in Singapore, contributing my own efforts. So I think uh, it is actually going to go a long way, and perhaps uh, we are not in a position to actually, uh, you know, stop this negativity at this point because uh, the media, the sensationalism, the political interest is all that surrounds Pakistan. The geographical location is very sensitive where Pakistan is right now. So. What Jimmy Engineer is doing, Mr. Jimmy Engineer, what we are doing, Pakistanis, we majority are living in U some of them, you know, majority in fact living in US. So they are all, you know, doing this. So I think for the past like ten years, we've been, uh, you know, struggling through this. So hopefully we are all positive, and uh, in a few years we get through this. I'll give an actual example just now. Businessmen of India came to Pakistan start business with Pakistani businesses. They were very happy. They were received at the border, they came and everything. And next day, the Indian media showed three people, terrorists entering India. And they were only shopkeepers. They were shopkeepers of some businessmen and they were shown on all the media. And then they had to retract the statement, the Indian media, that they were only shopkeepers. But because they didn't want the businessmen to come there and start business. They just showed three faces. One was a security guard of a shopkeeper, one was a salesman, and another one. And the whole Indian media was showing their faces and they were thinking that they are going to enter and do some terrorism. Now, those three people were just shopkeepers. And it was exposed then. All over the world it was exposed. So I'm just saying the 1% that you were telling me now, so this is the 1%. We, didn't want the, we were very happy with the Indian businessmen coming to Pakistan and starting business. And we were all happy that they came. And we received them, and everybody received them. They were very happy. And, and next day, all over the media, there were three faces, and they were just shopkeepers. Because they were shown in our local TV, they're sitting on the shop. So that's why I think that this will never end, actually. But as I said, when we will be spiritually enlightened, then I think there is chances that more peace will come. Uh, Professor Tamiko. <coughs> I'm, I'm an admirer of Jimmy Engineer, who is an exceptionally gifted artist, also a very passionate social and moral crusader. I met him only a year ago when I was asked by the High Commission whether I could open an exhibition of seven contemporary Pakistani artists uh, brought here by a gallery in Lahore. And uh, it was a very beautiful exhibition, but I wish more Singaporeans had seen it. It was well publicized. And my impression is that the contemporary artists of Pakistan uh, are reflecting both their heritage, but also reflecting the mainstream movements of world contemporary art. They are not very different. Singapore's contemporary artists. So for me, that was quite an eye-opener, you know? Um, reading what Narendra Agrawal writes about Pakistan, you wouldn't get the impression that, that Pakistan is not just terrorists and extremists. Um, you suffer from a bad time. But, I, but it's in the nature of the media, you know? Good news is not news, and so the media naturally focuses on bad news. Um, I'm very intrigued by your point that 99% of Indians and 99% of Pakistanis want peace with each other. And it's the 1% on both sides that don't want peace. So I have an idea to share with you. I remember reading um, 
the answer of a Pakistani leader who was Prussian. What have we got in common with the Indian? And this brave Pakistani leader said, we have nothing in common with India, except for the language we speak, the food we eat, the music we listen to. And I thought, gee, what a great answer. Why, why don't you, the artist, the musician, the poet, why don't you empower the 99% and reduce the influence of the 1% who don't want peace? Why don't you artists do something? Actually, our very famous singer, actor, they go to India. Very professional singers come back. But the main thing that brings them together is the cricket match, you know. When they have cricket match, you know, it's uh, everybody's together. They have the Indians are putting flags on the cheeks and faces and heads and clothes and everything. So I think there are common factors. There are common factors. But we keep trying. You know, we have to try. But alone cannot do it. I think it's everybody's job to combine their efforts, you know, and bring people together. Don't need to be very blunt with you. What? Don't need to be very blunt with you. Be blunt with you. I'll be very blunt with you. And I hope that. Hi, Kanesha. Well, forgive me for asking this question. Um, the, the media here, this is not for reporting. No, no, it's not. <laughs> uh, my blunt question is, does the Pakistani army want peace with India? Does the Pakistan army want peace with India? I think, I think eventually everybody's tired, actually, of fighting. And everybody is tired of aggressiveness. I think everybody wants peace. Everybody wants peace. Yeah, I think yeah. too much has yeah, happened. Yeah. Too many lives have lost. Even in partition, so many lives lost. Then in the <coughs> wars and the other wars, and so many people are dying both ways. And you know, both countries, there is poverty. There is poverty. If you go to India, you'll see a lot of poor people there. You go to Pakistan, you'll see poor people. You go to Bangladesh, you'll see poor people. But still, they are aggressive towards each other. I think the good sign was that the businessmen came from India. It's a good sign that we have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. So I think uh, we all hope that peace will someday come in all the countries of the world, actually. Sure, sure. The chair recognizes Mr. Juma Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, your sentiments are admirable. I agree with you. Uh, I have. Uh, I belong to the whole subcontinent, but my country is Singapore. So from here, where I live and operate where I was born. I have relationships with the whole subcontinent. The problem is that I happen to be a Muslim, and I dislike my religion being manipulated by so-called of the bearded brethren into something which Islam is not. These are the guys who ought to be hanged. And I may make no bones about that. Uh, wherever they occur, wherever they occur. And I think they have been manipulating the population in the name of my religion which I violently disagree with. I mean, violently means in the sense that I would try them and hang them. <laughs> Your prime minister gets killed. <clears throat> a governor gets killed for blasphemy. Cannot understand this. There's something wrong. And the, the, I think the majority of Pakistanis do not agree. I think the voice of, real voice of Pakistan should rise. Uh, in, incidentally, I'm not, not only blaming that, there is also uh, right wing in your neighbors. These are equally guilty people who have done things. So I would think that that would be a more rational explanation of what is happening. The manipulation of Islam. <clears throat> Actually, I think uh, in Islam, I'll give you one example that. Islam says that you share 
anything that you have more with you with those who don't have. And the other thing is that it says that if you look around and there's somebody hungry, then you don't eat first feed him. So there are a lot of there are all positive things in Islam, but if they don't practice properly, then it's not the fault of the religion. So I think Islam is a beautiful religion. I follow Islam also. And I think that because religions sometimes are not followed properly in the true letter and spirit, that's why uh, things don't work out that way. But I think that uh, we should all try and work together. Thank you. Madam? I, I would, I would leave with Mr. Jani lived here long, have only, have only returned uh, after a five-year gap. And the things as far as the press, please do report everything that we are saying, or Mr. Junoboyo and Junior are saying. I, I, I would like you to report. That's what we suffered in Singapore from getting coverage in the press. Pakistani Association or Pakistani News, was, it was difficult. So for a country like Singapore, where we've lived long, done very good things in minority, has not gone through press quite that easily. So there is that uh, struggle that we have to still and Mr. Engineer's visit, I'm sure, is a positive, yet another feather in our cap. But I absolutely agree with Mr. Jumabhoy, and I would just like to ask you that you did not say yes. That is true. That he didn't say anything to the religion of Islam. He's saying that the professors of Islam in our country are absolutely ruining it. So I think spirituality, but a little bit more secular, outlook, which does not mean unreligious, is what is required, and very high uh, support of minority, minorities' rights, the Hindus, the Parsis, the Christians, sh should be highlighted all the time, and I thought Mr. Engineer does try to go across, and as I've seen growing up, and I, I am an admirer of your work and your mission, but uh, spirituality, yes, spirituality, also means an, an, an engulfing us. So I think you would endorse it with your visit here, with your mission, that lets Pakistan does get bad press. We are bad marketers of our good work. That is true. But we need to condemn what is condemnable, always, without shame. When you say professors of Islam, you don't mean Muslim professors. Professing. <laughs> professing. The people professing Islam. <laughs> yeah. And in a very literal way. Yeah. Uh, do you want to react to that? Uh, well, uh, she agrees basically with, uh, with you and what uh, Mr. Juma Boyle has said, and she stresses the uh, point that this is not uh, what he said or the comments made was not directed against uh, Islam as such, but those who profess to, uh, to okay. follow Islam. I'll just give a very short answer. In Islam, it is said that if you are not a good human being, Everything then you can't be a good man. You can't be a Muslim. This is the first principle of Islam. That you have to be a good human being to become a Muslim. So I think uh, it's such it's, it's very good. Yeah, very good. I mean, that is also uh, perhaps the basic tenet of most religions that are represented even in this room. I mean, that is what a good Christian will think, that is what a good Hindu will think, and that is what a good Buddhist will think. And these states do uh, stress this point that uh, basically you have to be a good person. Thank you, Mr. Jimmy Engineer. And uh, I would also like to express, uh, Professor Koh, uh, my appreciation to you on behalf of ISAS for, for helping us put together this event uh, and gracing us with your presence. You too, High Commissioner, thank you very much, you and your office, for, uh, for taking part. Uh, you will give me the book, uh, but just before that, let me uh, do something that is a pleasant duty on my part. First of all, of course, I'd like to invite you to a recep tea reception afterwards. And on behalf of ISAS, I would like to give the small token of our appreciation for spending this We will have this. Uh, he, in return, will uh, give us a. Uh, Make it this is a heavier book. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Ja, ja.